When the United States entered World War I in 1917, a barrier was set up against Wisconsin, after which it became anecdotally known as the Trader State because of the immense amount of German culture. The Trader State label spurred Wisconsinites, later known as hyperpatriots, to prove their nationalistic fervor. Although German immigrants had begun settling in America during the colonial period, more than 5 million arrived in the 19th century. As late as 1910, about 33% of the American population had been born in Germany or was of German parentage, the highest percentage of any ethnic group. Following the new wave of immigration, most German Americans lived in large cities such as Milwaukee, Wisconsin. In certain cities, they made up as much as 35% of the populace. German Americans wielded strong economic and cultural influence in cities. However, their nationality became a problem when World War I started and the U.S. declared war against Germany. Within weeks, Wisconsin was being referred to as the traitor state. Wisconsin's 700,000 immigrant and first-generation German residents had no desire to make war on their relatives. One journalist visiting Wisconsin in 1917 stated, Wisconsin is really the most backward state I've struck in its sentiment toward the war. American entry into the war with Germany unleashed a torrent of hysterical conformity. Anything and anyone with ties to Germany became vulnerable to charges of disloyalty. Milwaukee was the home of the U.S. citizens known as hyperpatriots. The hyperpatriots made an aggressive effort to clear Wisconsin of its unpatriotic reputation. These hyperpatriots were typically business leaders and other white collared professionals. When the hyperpatriots wanted something done, it got done. They pressured neighbors to buy Liberty Bonds or forced housewives to sign the food pledge, which stated that all patriotic men and women would voluntarily restrict their food usage so that the soldiers overseas were always well fed. Efforts by the hyperpatriots to enforce support for the war were especially rampant in Milwaukee. Along with being heavily German-American, the city also happened to be governed by a socialist mayor, Dan Hone, whose party opposed the war. In 1910, Victor Berger, the Socialist Party's heaviest hitter, became the first socialist elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Berger launched the Milwaukee Leader, a socialist newspaper. Although Berger failed to gain re-election in 1912, he paved the way for socialism in Milwaukee politics. Milwaukee socialists, like socialists everywhere, opposed U.S. intervention in World War I. They believed that war promoted capitalist interests at the expense of working class people. Fed by war propaganda, many Americans became nervous about the existence of German spies and traitors and were intent on removing all things German from their communities. Some of their actions were humorous. The hamburger became a Liberty Burger, wieners became hot dogs, and German measles were renamed Liberty Measles. Patriotic Americans refrained from playing games like Pinochle because it sounded a little too German. An irrational fear of anything German overtook the nation and lasted throughout the war. On a more serious level, zealous Wisconsin patriots banned the German language in elementary schools, burned German books, and tarred and feathered German Americans suspected of opposing the war efforts. Additionally, German-American businesses were boycotted and many people of German heritage were physically and verbally attacked. The only way German-Americans could avoid persecution was to deny their German heritage. Within the first four months after the U.S. declaration of war, 250 people reportedly abandoned their German family names. Additionally, the number of German language teachers in Milwaukee dropped from 200 to 1. To help allay the fears of German influence, President Woodrow Wilson signed the Espionage Act in June 1917 and the Sedition Act in May 1918. The Espionage Act imposed fines of up to $10,000 and jail sentences up to 20 years on people convicted of recruiting or aiding the enemy. The act also authorized the Postmaster General to ban any mail he considered treasonable. The Sedition Act made it a crime to speak against the purchase of war bonds or to utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the United States. Patriots flooded the Wisconsin court system with charges against their fellow citizens. Charges include criticizing America's war policy, praising Germany, or arguing that the war created a class struggle. An atmosphere of repression and tension spread throughout Wisconsin. 
German-American men rushed to prove their loyalty to the U.S. by enlisting in the military. In total, there were over 122,000 soldiers from Wisconsin serving during World War I, and a majority of them were German. President Wilson, in a 1917 Flag Day speech, fueled the fire of prejudice. Military masters of Germany filled our unsuspecting communities with vicious spies and conspirators, sought to corrupt the opinion of our people on their own behalf. When they found they could not do that, their agents diligently spread sedition amongst us and sought to draw out our own citizens from their allegiance. German Americans were the only people feeling pro-war pressure. Socialist religious leaders and the Milwaukee labor movement were all subject to harassment and intimidation from the hyper-patriots. Factory owners saw any attempt by workers for improved pay or conditions as pro-German plots to disrupt industrial capacity. To help pay for wartime production, United States Treasury Secretary William McAdoo encouraged all Americans to purchase government bonds promoted as liberty loans. Patriotic citizens who purchased the bonds could later redeem them, collecting what they paid plus interest. The federal government set state quotas for each liberty loan drive on a community by community basis. Wisconsin did not meet its quota during the first two bond drives. Mortified, many hyper patriots blamed German Americans. To avoid future embarrassment, heavily populated German-American parts of the state, like Milwaukee, Racine, and Kenosha, began to oversubscribe on their quotas. Hyperpatriot members kept track of who did and did not purchase their fair share. The Patriots used a variety of ways to coerce people into meeting their quotas. Mobs threatened hanging, property destruction, or tarring and feathering. Many victims gave in to the mob's demands, whether they could afford to or not. As a result, Wisconsin met its quota in the last three bond drives. In total, Wisconsin residents purchased more than $300 million worth of Liberty loans from 1917 to 1918. Less than 18 months after Wisconsin was deemed the traitor state, public opinion swung from largely anti-war to overwhelmingly pro-war. Despite all the effort the German-Americans went through to blend in, German-Americans would still face a similar struggle with the start of World War II. My great-grandpa, Herbert J. Steinbach, served in the U.S. Army Air Corps from October 27, 1942 to February 13, 1946. He served for the United States but wasn't allowed to go overseas because he was born in Germany and immigrated to Wisconsin. Despite hyper-patriot efforts to denounce Wisconsin as a traitor state, over 20 years later, public opinion remained that German Americans would sympathize with the enemy. In my opinion, the hyper-patriots went too far in order to break the barrier of being known as the traitor state. But a lesson can be learned from their example. American citizens, regardless of their country of ancestry, should not be forced to go to the extreme measures to prove their loyalty to the United States.